and welcome Jack. Um, I'm sure you're all going to take something inspiring away from his presentation. Uh, first of all, I'm here with myself, I'm Virginia Van Sluice with the Elks organization who is sponsoring this along with Kirk Mansfield with the Rice County Veteran Memorial that's graciously donated funds so that we could put this event on. So we do thank both of those organizations. Um, also want to thank the Paradise Theater for donating their time. And back in the corner, Troy Temple, thank you so much for your time to come and film this uh, for us and so that Jack can have a copy afterwards. But uh, I'm going to turn this over to Kirk. He's just going to say a few things about uh, Jack and then do a in brief introduction to him and turn it over for him. But thank you all for coming. All right, well, just um, as Virginia said, uh, my name is Kirk Mansfield. I'm representing uh, the Rice County Veterans Memorial and also a Faribault American Legion here in town. And so we also have a representation of Mr. Richard Cook is here with us today, along with the Rice County Veterans Memorial. But uh, again, we want to thank uh, Troy for filming this uh, for FCTV purposes, and then also uh, to the Paradise Theater. Heidi, thank you guys so much uh, for allowing us to hold this event here today. Uh, very much looking forward to what Jack has to say. Um, when you came in, you probably noticed uh, Jack and Megan were sitting out front. Um, they have uh, Jack's recent book that came out this last year. Uh, before we got going, uh, Jack asked me um, if I could just go ahead and read the entire book to you guys. So you guys, you kind of got an idea where he's coming from. <laughs> so, no, we won't get to that level. But uh, I did want to make a couple of notes. Um, I first met Jack uh, back, it's been 11 years ago now, we were just talking about that September of 2011, which was about six months after he'd gotten hit. And they had a homecoming, uh, they'd actually come back for, to Cleveland for the homecoming game, I believe it was, during that time frame. And uh, just kind of a note that something came up, uh, your cousin Tina is actually how I uh, come to know about um, when you got wounded in action. And they had a big fundraiser that summer, I think that was in June, of 2011 over at Cleveland. They did a, a, a full day golf tournament and then they did a motorcycle ride. And I think we had your dad and, I mean, you had quite a crew. I mean, there was a couple hundred bikes on that ride. So we took about 30 uh, Legion riders from here and we met up with uh, other groups um, for that event. And it was, it was pretty monumental. But then we found out about you coming home. And so they flew them into Mankato Regional Airport and we were just talking about this. And I just remember being down at the airport on the flag line and we had approximately 200 uh, Patriot Guard members there on the flag line. And when the, the plane landed, uh, they let us to come out on the tarmac. And so we basically made a big circle uh, of flags around that. And when Jack came off, he was, you know, grinning from ear to ear. He was uh, obviously happy to be back home. And, uh, you know, by all rights, Jack could have just got off that plane and gone straight into the terminal. Uh, but that's not really his style. Uh, what he did is he actually went around to every single person on that flag line and just thank them for being there. So when he got to me, I just extended my hand and uh, said, welcome home, Jack. And he says, man, it's good to be home in Minnesota, you know. So, and that kind of started the ball rolling with our relationship over the last 11 years or so. And so we've, we've seen each other off and on over the years and uh, probably uh, different time frames. Uh, one other uh, memorable event, um, when you got off the plane in Mankato, he had made note that like, hey, I'm not gonna be able to go visit every single person that I need to see, so we're having an open house at your folks' place. So what we did is we took another group from here in Faribault. And uh, one of the things that was most memorable that, uh, for those of you folks that remember George DeLay, uh, George is a World War II veteran that fought in Guadalcanal. And so when we went over to Jack's house, we had, I don't know, 60, 80 bikes. And uh, we showed up at, at the driveway and Jack was sitting in the driveway like, like he is here now. And uh, I, I come up to Jack and I said, well, Jack, I did the best I could do on short notice with only a couple of days. and." Uh, Here's what we got for you, you know. So I proceeded to introduce everybody to Jack and uh, George DeLay. Uh, if you know him, uh, he's passed now, but uh, God, God bless his soul. But at that time, he was around 95 years old. And what was actually kind of a lead up to that is when we were sitting at the American Legion, uh, George was a little late getting there. We were supposed to leave at noon to get to Cleveland by one o'clock for the open house. Well, here comes George DeLay. He had just come from church. And when he arrived, we had all the motorcycles basically already starting to form up in the street. But when George arrived, he came into the Legion and he says, hey, do we have time for a beer before we go see Jack? <laughs> and you know, and I'm, I'm thinking, well, 
you know, we're on kind of a timeline, but who am I to tell a World War II vet no to a beer, you know? So, so he proceeded to buy us both a beer, and we had a beer before we came to see Jack. But when we got over there, like I said, we went through the whole lineup, and George was the last one in the line. And so when I got to introduce him to Jack, I said, Jack, this, uh, this, honorable, this honorable man here fought in Guadalcanal. And Jack looks at George, and he says, hey, I just want to thank you for your service and your sacrifice. And George, uh, being the consummate gentleman that he is, he looks at Jack and he took his cane and he wrapped it on the side of your wheelchair. I don't know if you remember this specifically. He says, my sacrifice, my sacrifice. And he's, look at you, young man. He goes, thank you for your sacrifice. And you looked at him direct and you said, you're worth it. And George told me later, like the week later when I seen him, he says, I never had anybody in my entire life told me that I was worth it. And he goes, that just about brought me to tears. And so Jack had laid that down on him in such a way. But that's, this is the kind of young man you're, you're dealing with here. So one other item. Um, fast forward into uh, March of 2014. A young man from Wasika, Caleb Erickson, was killed in action in Afghanistan. And so again, we're standing on the flag line. And while we're there, uh, Jack's pickup rolls up. And he's got the boom in the back. And I recognized it immediately. So I told the guy who was standing next to me, I said, hey, that's Jack. He goes, yeah, that's awesome, you know. And Jack, I don't know if you remember this, but when you came to see uh, Caleb's family that day, uh, the parking lot across the street from the church um, in downtown Wasika, Jack, by all rights, could have parked in any of the spaces that were designated right in front of that church, but he took a different tact. He drives all the way to the end of the parking lot, and my buddy Darnell is like, are you seeing this? I go, I'm seeing every bit of it. And so here comes Jack out in his chair, and he comes through, and he rolls through this big old puddle that everybody had been sidestepping all day. And when he got to the street, he looks up and down both sides. And if you remember this, we had that whole street line, one block, um, both sides of the street, almost shoulder to shoulder with flags. Same deal. Jack went to every single person on both sides of the street to thank them for being there. And when he got to me, I said, hey, what's your connection to Caleb? He goes, I never met the young man. I just heard that he was killed in action. I'm just here to pay respects to this family. And so I thought that was a, kind of a, a, a big moment, too. Uh, just kind of goes to show you where he's coming from. So then if you fast forward a little bit, um, we've met each other off and on over the years. Uh, you're generally with the Elysian squad or uh, Cleveland squad in Elysian for the 4th of, Day, 4th of July parade. So I think I seen you there last year. Um, we talked and had a beer then. Um, just a couple of things about his book. Um, the book that he has out front, he talks about this first chapter about when he got hit. And he talks about, and you can describe more at length, but I think it was, it was some to the fact you didn't want, you wanted the first chapter to be that because it's not the end of your story and you'll be able to elaborate on that as you go through. Um, Jack's gonna talk a lot about overcoming adversity, any obstacles that it's in his way, how he deals with that, and how it, it's a lesson to all of us on how we can move forward. So a lot of it's, he just doesn't waste time thinking about why this happened. It's uh, whatever's presented, this is where we're at now. Uh, as I read through your book, uh, one of the chapters you talk about, uh, today is the first day of the rest of your life. And when I seen that, I just about, uh, uh, I. I had to double over just about, because when I read that, I remember back uh, growing up in Northwest Iowa, my grandmother had a little plaque on the wall in the farmhouse, and it said exactly that. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. You know, when you're a young kid, you don't really realize what that meaning is, but as you grow and come of age, you start to understand that better, and I think that's one of the creeds that you live by, is each day is a gift from God, and we're all here, we're blessed, and you should treat each day as, as it is. Um, so with that... Um, Jack, uh, always service over self. He's always willing to give to others, uh, you know, not only within his family structure, uh, many, many things that he'll talk about today, but uh, I think that's a big thing, service over self, and, and that's a lot we can take away from that. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jack Zimmerman. That's the, that's the best intro I've ever had. Thank you, Kirk. That was, that was amazing. Thank you for that. And... Uh, um, Sometimes when we're doing things in life, we don't even realize how much of an impact we're having on others, you know? And uh, it goes both ways, you know? When people show up to support you, you have to thank them for that because uh, it's important, you know, to support each other and encourage each other to support each other. Um, like Kirk said, my name's Jack Zimmerman. Uh, I grew up just down the road from here, uh, not far in Cleveland. And uh, I was just your typical kid, always getting in trouble, getting kicked out of class, you know, that kind of kid. And uh, um, I love playing sports. I played a lot of sports growing up, and uh, I played football and basketball, and, and uh, 
I didn't really enjoy that aspect of school, but not so much the book work. And uh, I got out of school, and uh, I wanted to be an electrician. And uh, so I went down to Albert Lee for a year, and, and I went to school down there, and then over the summer I got a job working as an electrician. And I was working on the Justice Center in Mankato for the Blue Earth County Justice Center. And uh, I really loved it. I really loved being an electrician. I loved the challenges of every day, and I loved getting better at something every day. And, and uh, but it just wasn't that exciting, you know, getting electrocuted every now and then just didn't really do it for me, you know. And I needed more out of life. And I always wanted to join the military, you know, when I was, when I was in school, I seen the trade towers fall. And I seen all the guys go over to Afghanistan and Iraq. And, and uh, I always, I always, I always uh, got stars in my eyes whenever I seen those guys, you know. I thought that was uh, what, what uh, the, the men of men, you know. And uh, I always wanted to be that, but I never really had anybody around me that, um, to really guide me on how to really get into the military, to get to where I wanted to go, and I never stepped foot in a recruiter's office. I never, you know, you always had heard the horror stories and stuff like that. I, don't, I won't step foot in another recruiter's office, that's for sure. I'm just kidding. If you got that joke or not, I don't know. Uh, but uh, one day I was working as an electrician, and I remember sitting at the break table, and across from me there was a guy talking about retiring, and there was a guy sitting here uh, talking about how bad his shoulder hurt, and there's a guy here next to me uh, talking about his kids, and I had this, I was probably hungover at the time, and uh, I thought to myself, uh, what am I doing here right now? I need more excitement in my life, you know? I want, uh, I want, I want more out of it, you know? And so that day I left, uh, I left work, and I went right down to the recruiter station, and I uh, went through the doors there, and I said, I want to go to Iraq or Afghanistan, I want to get there as fast as I can, I want to be on the front lines, how do I do that? And he's like, don't move. And for whatever reason, he yelled over his shoulder, I got one, whatever that meant, you know. Uh, and uh, so, but I told him, the only thing I really want to do when I get in the military is I want to learn how to jump out of planes. So I got my airborne contract, and I went down to Fort Benning, Georgia, and I did my basic training down there. It was 13 weeks. It was called one unit station training. And uh, so that means you do your basic training in infantry school all in one, and it's just an extended version of basic training, right? So it's 13 weeks long, and I started in September of 2009. And uh, I trained all the way up until Christmas, and at Christmas time I became an infantryman, and I graduated from uh, infantry school. And uh, then I got, came home for Christmas, and uh, I had a good time, and I went back in, in January then, and I, and I got to do jump school. And uh, jump school's a really fun process. Uh, the first week you jump off a log onto the ground and you practice falling down. And, uh, and then the next week is tower week, so you go up in this tower and you jump out on this giant zip line to practice getting out of the plane. And then the third week you jump, so they always tell you, if you can figure out how to land and you can figure out how to get out, you'll figure out everything in between, right? And uh, the rest will just pan out. And uh, so I so I'd, uh, got my airborne wings, and uh, I thought I was going to go to a unit that I would, I would continue to jump with, but I actually, I actually got orders to the 101st Airborne Division. And the one thing about the 101st Airborne Division is, is now we don't even jump out of planes anymore. We're actually air assault units. So we fly around in helicopters, jump out, run the mission, get it back on the helicopter, and leave. So uh, I, when I got to Fort Campbell, then where the 101st Airborne Division is, uh, the first thing that they said to me when I got there is, don't unpack your stuff. We're headed to Afghanistan. So wish come true, right? I get to go to the front lines. And uh, we headed out then. Uh, super cool. We got to go. Uh, June 6th of 2010, then I deployed to Afghanistan. So I graduated, you know, basic training at the beginning of the year, did uh, jump school, and a few months later, I'm on my way to Afghanistan. And uh, it was really cool to deploy on June 6th uh, because that's the D Day, uh, same day that uh, the 101st Airborne Division, one of our most uh, legendary days of jumping into Normandy. And uh, so those, all those guys were there on post giving us these, uh, you know, speeches to go, to go find the Taliban and run them out, right? And uh, it was just a very surreal day. And I remember walking on the plane with all my stuff. And you just get on this commercial plane. And uh, they flew us over to Kyrgyzstan then. And that's where we get ready to stage to go into Afghanistan. They give us our bullets and all of our fun stuff, you know. And so we all jump on the plane then and uh, onto, a, onto a military plane. Then from Kyrgyzstan, we fly into Kandahar. And I remember walking into Kandahar, you know, landing in Kandahar and walking off the plane. I remember carrying my bags. I remember feeling how, I remember feeling how winded I was. Um, because of the elevation change. So we spent a couple of weeks in Kandahar just getting climatized, they call it, you know, getting used to the elevation, getting used to the heat and everything else. And uh, it wasn't long, we found ourselves flying out and uh, we landed on the, on the north side of, the, of uh, so I should explain this better. We landed at Kandahar. Kandahar would be like the, the state in the country of Afghanistan. And then there was the Zari district where we were going to. 
And, and the Zari district is where the Taliban first originated from ever, right? And that was the heart of the Taliban, that's where they were. And the Zari district would be like the county, right? And that's where we were gonna go and that was gonna be our area of operations. And uh, <clears throat> where we were going, no Americans had been before. So we landed on the north side of this Highway 1 and we built a base called Fab Hausi Madad and that was gonna be our, our main hub that we were gonna work out of out, out, out where we were at. And uh, where we were at, it was, a lot, it was very much um, countryside, you know, they grew pretty much, there, there, were, there were farm people that lived down there, but they farmed little things a little bit different than corn and soybeans. They farmed uh, marijuana and opium. So uh, they were the good time farmers, I guess some people would say. Uh, that's all they grew down there. That was, that was what they made the most money on. That's how they made their living. And uh, uh, when we landed on the north side of Highway 1, uh, they really didn't mess with us too bad. They shot at us a little bit. They shot a few mortars at us, but nothing too, too exciting. But the minute that we walked across Highway 1, it was on. And uh, we, we uh, ended up going to a place called Cop Terminator. That was like our first uh, company outpost that we went to. And uh, we started patrolling out of there. And um, it was... Uh, it was a good place to get to, to acclimate. You know, we started getting our first gunfights there and this and that, and we started, things started intensifying as we were there as the summer went on. And uh, uh, we fought there for all summer long, and finally the, the fighting started coming to an end towards the end of the year. And um, uh, it got us all the way up till uh, October, and that's when I experienced my, my worst day in Afghanistan. It was, uh, first it was October 15th, which was a great day. Um, I got a call over the radio that my best friend Land, that his daughter was just born and she, she weighed this and they named her Riley and it was just amazing. And uh, it was just uh, a few weeks later, Land was ready to go home and meet his daughter and I was up in a guard tower and I remember my platoon sergeant coming up there and asking me if I wanted to volunteer for the mission that day and I volunteered for every single mission. I said, hey, I'm here to serve my country. Whatever you need me to do, I'm here to do it, you know? And I was especially gonna volunteer to get my best friend to a man-made mountain called Gundigar. And Gundigar was a man-made mountain for Alexander the Great, and we decided that it's a, it was a pretty great spot to overlook the whole Argandab Valley, and we decided we wanted it, so we built a base on top of it. And uh, that's where we were getting helicopters in and out of. It was the best place to get somebody on a chopper. And we had to drive just a few short miles to get there, but we had to go through this village. And uh, as we loaded up the trucks that morning on October 30th to get land, the only reason we are going to the Gundigar was just to get land on a chopper. And uh, we put, rolled out that day, and there's four trucks, and, and uh, we, were go, we, we were approaching this village, and we see these guys running, and, and we knew it, was, it wasn't good. And uh, the first truck goes over this culvert in the center of town, the second truck goes over the culvert, and the third truck gets blown, blown in the air, right? And I'm in the fourth truck. And um, we try to recover that vehicle. We have two different styles of trucks. We have an MATV and an MRAP, and the MRAPs weren't really very powerful machines. You know, they were pretty, pretty, pretty sad, really. And the MATVs were incredible. They were great. And uh, the truck we had blown up was an MATV. So we had two MRAPs and an MATV left. And we used, tried to use one of the MRAPs to try to drag it. It just didn't have enough power. So we we're going to hang up, uh, hook up an, uh, the MATV to just drag this thing out of the center of town. We just didn't want to be in the middle of town stranded, you know? And uh, Land was down in the ditch saying, back, 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 back. And my buddy Corb up. And that's when he stepped on an IED. And uh, it killed him. Um, right then and there. And that was my worst day in Afghanistan, thinking about he was trying to go home to meet his daughter for the first time and, you know, she was going to get to meet him and he didn't make it. You know, that was, that, was my, that was my worst day in Afghanistan. And the fighting kids slowed down then big time as November rolled along in December and then New Year's Day kicked off again and, and the fighting was on and we fought for a while. And uh, I always joke, this is how I keep track of things in my life. So somewhere between the Super Bowl and the Daytona 500 in February, uh, that's when I got to come home on my leave, and uh, I came home for two weeks, and uh, it was nice to get out of country for a little bit. You know, we had we'd been we'd been battling a long time down there, and I was ready for a break. And uh, I came home, and I spent two weeks back here, just seeing everybody, having a good time. And and uh, the night before I went back, I I did the best thing I ever did. I, I got down on a knee, and it was uh, my last chance <laughs> uh, to get down on a knee and ask my wife to marry me. And uh, I said, will you marry me and can I get a ride to the airport in the morning? And she said yes to both. And uh, very romantic like that, you know? And, uh, and uh, so I went back to Afghanistan and it was 10 days later and it was March 9th. And uh, I was up in a guard tower. Um, you know, when, you're, when we're on these, on these uh, 
company outposts, you know, there's, we only have so many guys in a platoon, you know, so there's guys patrolling, there's guys, you know, working, keeping the base maintained, there's guys pulling security all the time. There's not a lot of people down there to do all these things. And uh, so you're always doing something. And uh, I remember it was super early in the morning, it was, uh, and uh, I got up in the guard tower, I spent my four hours up there, and I came up and I got relieved. Somebody else was gonna pull guard for a while. And I remember coming out of my guard tower, and I had my gear over my shoulder, and I was carrying my rifle in my other hand. And um, I walked into our, go up to our tent, and, and when we come up to our tent, uh, there's this big wall, a dirt wall there, kind of protecting the tent. And we had a, a thing draped from the top of the tent onto the wall, and it was kind of like a sunshade. And that's where everybody hung out, because, like I said, people were doing stuff all the time. So if you were in the tent, you were sleeping or being quiet. If you weren't, you were out of the tent, you know, so everybody else in there could sleep. So everybody was sitting out on the porch, you know, eating and, and smoking and having a good time. And uh, I remember stopping and visiting with those guys for a minute, and I decided I was going to go in and set my gear down. So I went and set my gear down. In the front of the tent, there's a giant whiteboard that says what everybody's going to be doing for the day, and I seen that I was going on patrol. Not unusual. I mean, we patrolled almost every single day, so um, I just seen that I was going on the morning patrol. And... Uh, so I went and laid down in my bunk for a while and I was going through my camera and I was deleting pictures that I didn't want and uh, for whatever reason I had the urge or the, the intuition or whatever the word we're thinking of here is, but my feet were crossed up on the end of the bunk and the last picture I took on my camera was my feet crossed on the end of my bunk and I remember sliding my camera in and my team leader coming by and saying, hey, let's go outside for the mission brief. So we went outside and we got briefed on the mission and the goal for the day was is the Taliban had a cache of weapons and IED making materials. And uh, we were going to go steal it from them. Uh, <laughs> that's the kind of kids that we were anyway, so it'd be fun to go steal the Taliban stuff, right? And uh, so we decided we were going to go up there and do that. And uh, we had two teams out there with us, and then we had a bunch of guys in the middle. You know, um, the radio guy, and I think our, our first sergeant went out there with us that day, and, and um, our uh, lieutenant was out there. And we had a bunch of guys that were out there with us besides the two teams. And uh, I seen the team that I was on, um, Sergeant Hurley's team, um, we were going to be in the front. And uh, so we, were, we pushed out there and we pushed this village that we went to all the time. Those were outside of our base and we visited with the elder there for a little bit. And then we moved toward, closer to this base. And as we're moving up to this base, there's this giant berm on the, on the north end of town. We assume that that's the, they fought the Russians off of it, you know? And uh, my team leader says, hey, run up on that berm and uh, make sure there's not a bunch of guys laying on the other side of that thing ready to ambush us. So I ran up on top of that berm and I seen two guys running into town. I thought, oh, there's the guys we're looking for. And so I told Sergeant Hurley, he says, keep an eye on them and watch what buildings they go into. And uh, so I'm watching where these guys are running. And right as I'm watching these guys running, I look down and there's an IED literally <laughs> right in front of me. And I'm basically standing right on top of it. And uh, I was smart enough to get off of that one. And uh, I ran all the way down to the end of that berm and I was watching these two buildings these guys went into. And um, Sergeant Hurley went up and put a charge on that IED and he blew it up um, and basically eliminated the, th eliminated the threat of that IED. And uh, as soon as he blew it up, they thought we were shooting at them, so they started shooting at us. And we had a, a gunfight break out. And um, it was actually a pretty quick gunfight because we had helicopters that came in right away and made pretty light work of that day. And we hung out for a little bit, and we decided we weren't going to push any further to try to find this cache. And uh, we were going to head back to our base. And so uh, they call, did what's called reverse order of movement. So my team was in the front on the way out, so now the other team's going to take the front on the way back. And uh, so now we're in the back, we walk north a little bit, and we find this place across this ditch, and everybody's jumping across the ditch, and me being a machine gunner, saw gunner, uh, I was the last guy to cross, pulling security for everybody else. And so I jump across, and I'm fanning back out onto the left flank, and whenever we walk, we walk a lot like, like geese, you know, kind of like in V's, you know? And uh, I was out on the left flank by myself, and, and the reason they put me on the left flank then th at that time was because that was the village that we just had gotten in a gunfight in. That's, that's kind of the village that we were skirting. So they wanted the, the firepower on the, on the side of the village. And uh, as we're walking across this field, uh, we have our interpreter's out there with us, and our interpreter, whenever he's out there, he has an earpiece in with a little radio, and he's listening to what the Taliban's talking about all the time, and he'll tell, uh, you know, the... Um, LT or the platoon sergeant with the Taliban saying, and we kind of have an idea what they're doing. And um, he said, hey, um, Sergeant Hurley said to me, hey, we're getting ICOM chatter that they're going to hit us again. And I said, hey, Sergeant Hurley, where do you think they're going to hit us from? And he goes, I don't know, Jackie boy, I don't wham. And he stepped right on that IED right then and there. And uh, I felt myself go flipping through the air, and it felt like 10,000 little needles crawling up my back. I could feel the heat, you know? And uh, I just remember flipping and flipping and flipping, and it just felt like I was tumbling, you know? 
And it felt like uh, one of those dreams that you have where you're falling and you can't wait, you know, you just feel like you can't wake up and you just keep falling. That's really what it felt like. And uh, I always joke about this too. When I landed, I finally landed. When I landed, I landed on my neck and my shoulder. And uh, I always joke, thank God I landed on my neck because that's all I had left. <laughs> and uh, I was, I was, as I was laying in this crater, I was trying to see out of my glasses and I couldn't really see much and I didn't know at the time, but it was, I just had so much blood and mud smeared across my glasses or stuck to my glasses, I couldn't hardly see out of them. I couldn't hear anything because I just <laughs> stepped on a, on, a, on a giant IED. And uh, the first thing I was looking at was my left arm over here and it was all blown out. And um, I knew I needed to get a tourniquet on it and my first aid kit was right here. And we always had it on, our, on your non-dominant hand so that way if I ever was hit, I could continue to shoot while I was still getting into my first aid kit. And uh, I remember trying to reach back to get to it because I knew I needed a tourniquet and I couldn't get it open. And, and I just kept looking at this arm trying to figure out what I was going to do about it. And uh, I was trying to get my night vision pouch open because I knew I had a tourniquet over there and I kept trying to peel it open, peel it open. And I thought, like, what the heck is going on? Why can't I get that pouch open? And when I looked over, my arm was just snapped right in half in the middle here. And every time my heart beat, then I'd see my, my, you know, my blood spray. And every time I see my heart beat, my arm was just hanging down. And I knew I was in pretty tough shape. And I had no idea my legs were hurt yet. And uh, I was laying there trying to figure out how I was going to get out of the situation. And that's when I started seeing tracer rounds going over my head. So I knew that we were shooting at something. And what I realized was is it was a complex ambush, right? I step on IED. They know we have us stuck out in the middle of this field. And they just start, you know, plummeting rounds on you, you know? And uh, I knew I was going to be there for a little bit because, you know, we always fight first and then take care of our wounded. And uh, so I was trying to figure out how I was going to perform self-aid. And all of a sudden, my buddy Daniels came running over on top of me, and he slid in on top of me. And uh, he started tourniquet my arms off for me right away. And uh, um, as he's tourniquet my arms off, I kept telling him, hey, man, <laughs> you got to get off of me. You're pinching my boys, right? I was starting to get a lot of, starting to get a lot of pain down there, you know? And uh, he's like, no, man, i got to stay here in this crater with you. Well, what he was doing is he had his knees in my femoral arteries here trying to pinch those off on my legs. And then he's trying to tourniquet my arms at the same time, you know? And so he's turning kitting me off, and then Doc came sliding in. As soon as Doc came sliding in, he cut my gear off me right away. And we have this tab on our, on our plate carriers that we, we can pull. Say we end up in the water, you know, and you, got, you, don't, you don't want body armor on in the water. You, I can hardly swim the way it is, you know. And so you have this tab that you can pull, or if you find, or if you find yourself in a situation that I was in, you can pull this tab, and you can get rid of your, your body armor really quick. And... Uh, I remember Doc pulling that tab and just throwing my plate. And as soon as he threw my plate, I was ready to get out of this field. I did not want to be out in the middle of this field anymore with no cover. And I sat up to get out of there, and that's when I realized that my right leg had been completely tore off. And my left leg from the knee down was in pretty tough shape. And uh, I just remember I had to stay, try to stay calm. And I seen how much blood I had lost. And you know, as I'm laying in this crater, I seen how much blood I was losing. And uh, according to my calculations, I carry an extra liter of blood than everybody else by looking at it. You know, I was, it was a lot. And uh, I remember them tourniqueting off this leg, and Doc had brought this ratchet strap style tourniquet with him. And he got that up around my leg, and I remember him reaching up inside of in my leg and grabbing whatever he could and just pulling down. And he just started ratcheting on my leg. And finally I remember him saying, I think we got it. You know, they finally got my, the bleeding to stop pretty much in my right leg. Or slow down, I should say, at least. And uh, I always joke that uh, us guys, we can find anything to complain about at any time in our lives. Uh, because I just remember telling Doc, I think it's too tight, it's too tight, it hurts, you know? And Doc's like, no, we gotta leave it, you know? And uh, I remember shaking my head left and right and left and right, trying to stay awake, and I remember being so thirsty, and I was just kept telling Doc, I just want something to drink, I want something to drink so bad, and he kept telling me no. And finally I complained enough that he gave me a piece of gauze with some water on it and shoved it in the corner of my mouth for me to suck on, and, and uh, just kind of me keep my mouth somewhat wet, you know? And uh, I remember the guys talking to me about stuff like uh, me and Daniels, where we were going to move in together when we got back from Afghanistan. And uh, he's like, you're still bringing the couch, right? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I uh, just trying to do anything to, you know, to keep talking. And finally, I couldn't talk anymore. And I just remember shaking my head left, right, left, right, left, right. And I thought to myself, I'm going to say anything. I need to say it right now because I'm at the point where I, don't have, I can't really even talk anymore. And uh, I just remember telling him, hey, tell everybody I love them. That's all I could think to say. And... As I was laying there, I started getting more and more tired, and finally I just started, just, I just thought I couldn't do it anymore, you know? And I started seeing my whole life start flashing before my eyes, like stuff as little as four or five years old, all up until just days before getting wounded. I seen 
all these things flashed from my eyes. It was all my greatest ex times. You know, it wasn't just me seeing my car. It was my friends with me in the car, you know, and my friends in the car. It was out in the fish house with my buddies. It was playing high school sports. It was doing all, all different experiences. And that's kind of where I realized at that point in my life that it was the people and the things that we do in our lives that are so important to us. And all of a sudden, I heard that, that very distinct sound, that woof, 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 that the sound of a rotors of a chopper coming. And I thought, man, I can't be the guy that dies right when that thing gets here. And I remember reaching deep down inside with everything that I had, and I just remember trying to draw in one more deep breath, you know, and just trying to suck some air into my lungs and trying to fill them. And uh, I took a giant deep breath, and I remember those guys rolling me up on my side, on my left side, and set me back down. And uh, Doc, this whole time, he's trying to stick a, a needle in my neck to try to get an IV going to get some fluids going for me. And I remember how frustrated he was getting with that. And finally, they picked me up on this litter, and I just remember looking down, and I see my foot riding right on my stomach, and I thought, oh, that's not good. <laughs> and uh, um, I remember the, how, ba how bad it hurt with them hauling me across the field. And that sign of pain, though, to me felt like, hey, this means I still got some life left in me. If this hurts, you know, at least I'm feeling something, you know? They slid me on that chopper, and I had the worst feeling in the world as soon as they slid me on that chopper. I looked over, and I see my buddy Hurley was, was sitting on the chopper already. And I thought he was dead, honestly. And uh, I just remember him looking up at me and uh, giving me some non-inspirational, but really real words, telling me what kind of condition I was in. <laughs> and uh, uh, I just remember hearing the rounds ripping off the chopper. And uh, um, the flight medic was talking to my, my medic. And I just remember him, Doc, saying, I put two tourniquets on each limb. And the flight medic saying, I don't give a shit. We got to go. And uh, I remember lifting off in the chopper. And that guy jumped on top of me, <clears throat> the flight medic did, and uh, he took his mask off. They had those masks, you know, so they can breathe with, with, with the wind and everything. And he took his mask off, and he told me this is going to hurt. I just, I mean, I couldn't even talk. You know, I was so exhausted at this point. And uh, I remember him telling me this is going to hurt. And I thought, right, what can, what can you do to me right now? It's going to hurt. Well, he's right. Uh, he put five. 10 gauge needles or whatever size needles they were right into my sternum to start giving me fluids. And I remember when he punched that deal into me, he just punched it right into my bone. And I remember just, <laughs> like I wanted to yell so bad. And I was like, wow, I'm still super alive. That hurts so bad. And him ringing out that bag of saline right over the top of me and him starting another one. And by the time we landed at Kandahar, I felt like I could talk again. I felt like I was, I was back to life, you know? I had some fluids in me. and. Uh, as soon as we landed at the airfield, I remember we sat down, and I could hear the, the rotor blades start slowing down on the helicopter. You know, we had air salted so much over there that every time you were in a helicopter, that thing was wide open, you know? It was taking off, and it was landing, and you get out, and it's gone, and you, they come pick you up, and they drop you off somewhere, and it's gone again, you know? It's just, I remember listening to them rotors slow all the way down. It kind of gave me a chance to reflect on the day, and uh, it just kind of gave me a chance to kind of unwind, you know, and hear those things just... It was kind of peaceful in a sense. And uh, I remember hearing that chopper door rip open, and they started pulling me out of there. And they put me in the back of this like uh, big, like, like a regular sized truck or whatever, but like had a big box on the back. It was like a makeshift ambulance. And uh, on this side of me was my anesthesiologist, and on this side of me was my surgeon. And the anesthesiologist, he first asked me if I was allergic to anything. And I was like, yeah, penicillin. <laughs> And he's like, well, we're not really worried about you being allergic to penicillin right now. And I was like, but I am. If I get hives right now, I don't have any hands to itch with, you know? That's all I can think about. That's all I can think about. And uh, uh, he's like, no, we're thinking more of the stuff, like we're going to anesthesia and stuff. I was like, no, I'm good. And uh, the surgeon, this is why my book is titled Five Minutes. The surgeon looked at me and said, if you can stay awake for five more minutes, I'll promise you your life. Whether he knew or not, I don't, I don't know, but uh, it gave me the confidence and the drive that I knew that I had a shot at this, uh, to survive this. Uh, I was like, deal, bet, you know? And uh, we back up to the, I remember hearing the backup beeper going on the truck then, and um, all of a sudden those doors ripped open on the truck, and they slid me out of my litter, and I remember them setting me down on this two-wheel cart. And the whole time I kept thinking, don't tip me over, don't flip me off this thing. Because, you know, whenever we trained with your buddies, as soon as you were done with the, you'd always just dump your buddy on the floor, right? And I was thinking, oh, don't dump me, don't dump me. And they set me right on this two-wheel cart, and it was so fast down the hallway. It was like light, 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 hard right. And uh, they brought me into the operating room. And I always say, you know, we have the world's greatest fighter jets, we have the best missiles, we have the best everything. 
we don't have heated operating room tables. Uh, the first time I ever jumped without legs, they picked me up off this litter and they set me on the operating room table and it was so cold. It was so cold. And uh, I remember that so distinctively. And uh, there's this gal there and she starts shaving my chest and stuff and starting to put all these little sticky things all over me. And uh, oh, there's people going around and I can hear packaging getting ripped open and I can hear like tools firing up. And uh, I just remember feeling so alone at that point in time. And I just wanted to be acknowledged. You know, I knew there were so many people around me, but I just felt like everybody was around me, but nobody could really see me, if that makes sense, you know? And I just wanted somebody to, I just wanted to feel like I was alive still. And I remember looking at the nurse and I thought, I just, I just want to say something to her, you know? So I thought, the only thing I could think to say to her was, this is the first bone I ever broke. And she said, well, you broke a lot of them. <laughs> and uh, uh, I did, it felt good that I felt like I was still alive. You know, I could still say something. And uh, the other guy comes over and he, start, he puts a mask on me. And uh, I asked him, what are you doing? And he's like, we're, we're, we're going to put you out now. And uh, I was like, no, you're not. <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, what do you mean? And I kept shaking my head to take this, this mask from getting it put on me. And he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, I did bet with a guy for five minutes. And he's like, oh, yeah. And he's like, hey, Doc. And Doc comes over and he's like, hey, man, we're going to do the best we can. You can go to sleep now. You know, your five minutes is up. And uh, I remember the anesthesiologist going, you can count back from 10. And uh, I thought to myself, my last, my last memory on this earth is not going to be one. So I started thinking about all those times, those best times I'd just seen in my life that were flashing before my eyes out on the battlefield. And uh, uh, I just remember falling right to sleep. And uh, the next time I woke up, I had a ventilator in my mouth. And uh, I remember like trying to look around and see what's going on. And I fell right back to sleep. The next time I woke up, I didn't have a ventilator in anymore. And uh, I remember this nurse leaving the room, and I was like, hey, never mind, I'm good. <laughs> and uh, I fell right back asleep. And uh, the next time I woke up, my whole family was around me. And uh, I just remember thinking to myself, what are you guys doing in Afghanistan? Don't you know how bad it is here? But it had been five days, and they had moved me from um, Afghanistan to San Antonio. And um, they took me from uh, Kandahar uh, Hospital, where I was flo air medevac back to, um, to Bagram to launch to Germany, and then uh, to Texas. And uh, when I woke up, my whole family was around me. And I remember everybody was, was talking, you know, or saying stuff to me. But if, if, I mean, most of you have probably seen Snoopy, you know, and they can Snoop when they're talking. It's like, wah, 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 wah. That's what it was like. You know, I was just looking at everybody like, what are you guys even talking about right now? You know, what, wait, why are you guys in Afghanistan? And I remember everybody telling me that, that I was in Texas and I had been moved. And uh, I remember uh, me just kind of staring at everybody. And my dad said to me, can you just say something so we know that you can hear us? And uh, the first words out of my mouth were, what do I have to do to get the hell out of here? <laughs> I did not want to be in the hospital. And they told me I was going to be here for a while. And everything kind of started coming back to me. You know, I started remembering, I started remembering the, um, the helicopter ride first. That was the first thing I remember. Oh, yeah, I got medevaced, you know. And then I was like, oh, yeah, I stepped on an IED. And then I was like, oh, man, where's Hurley? You know, I started thinking, where's he at then? And I, all these things were coming back to me. But when I woke up in the hospital, at that exact moment that I woke up and I had, I had a conscience thought, the first thing I had, I decided that I was not going to let an IED define the rest of my life. I was not going to let this IED stop me. And most importantly, I felt like if I quit right then and there at this point in my life, that I was going to let the Taliban win, right? And that's the last thing I was ever going to do. So I was not going to let this IED define the rest of my life. I'm not sponsored by Diet Coke, but I should be. So I realized that I was going to define the rest of my life. I wasn't going to let anything else define the rest of my life. Nothing was the same for me, though, when I woke up, right? Nothing in my life at all was even close to the same. I didn't move the same. My arms didn't work. Uh, my dreams were all different. My dream of being in the military for 20 years was over. Everything in my life that I knew up to this point now was not the same. Everything was different from here on out. But I realized at that point was is how I was going to react to every situation that came to me and that was all on me, right? I have all these people around me. I have the best doctors in the world, as far as I'm concerned, they are here taking care of me. I have my family by my side. I'm still alive. My best friend was just killed over there from the same thing that just happened to me. That's when I realized the attitude and perspective was everything, right? With a good attitude, we can overcome anything. With a bad attitude, we can't overcome anything. And I realized that how I reacted 
made everybody else around me react differently too, right? If I reacted positively, like, hey, we're gonna be all right, we're gonna get through this, everything's gonna be just fine, I'm still alive, we have doctors, I can be put back together or stitched up, <laughs> and we're gonna move on from this. So how we react to things in life really matters. Attitude and perspective, right? Somebody always has it worse than you, right? So I had to figure out what the best new version of me was gonna be, right? Like I said, all my dreams, all my goals, all those things were gone. So I had to figure out what the best new version of me was gonna look like. How can I live the life out that I wanted to live? Do I, I had to readjust my dreams. I had to readjust the way I was gonna do things. I had to readjust everything, right? So what I'm here telling you guys today is just because you're, you're the, the life that you wanted, the life that you wanted to achieve, the things that you wanted in life, the dreams that you once had, that doesn't mean that you have to scrap all those things. You might just have to adjust them. You might have to change them because things happen over the course of our lives, right? Just because I can't achieve the dreams that I want to achieve once at one point in my life doesn't mean that my life's over, right? We just have to change, create the best new version of ourselves. I had to realize that if it was broken, it was in my past. And if it was being worked on, it was in my future, right? I could sit there and close my eyes and hold my breath as long as I wanted to, but my legs were not gonna pop back out, right? I could sit there and, and cry and dwell on the fact that I don't have any legs, but how is that gonna help today? How is that gonna help me move forward in life? And how is that gonna help me achieve the things that I wanna achieve, right? We can't get stalled out in life focusing on the things that we don't like in life that are broken. We have to figure out either make a plan to fix it, because that's all life is, right? It's complex problem solving. That's all we have to do is just keep fixing problems all the time. So I had to make that decision that if it's broken, it was in my past, it was in my future, it's being worked on. So we can't stop and do all those things in our lives every single day that hold us up. We cannot do that, or otherwise we're just not moving anywhere in life. We have to realize that it doesn't ever matter how we find ourselves in a situation, right? It doesn't matter. You're already in that situation, but how are you going to get out of it, right? We have to go back to the basic things we've been talking about, building your attitude, shaping your perspective, right? that somebody else always has it worse than you, that you can do this, that God would never give you more than you can handle, right? So it doesn't ever matter how you find yourself in that situation. It just matters how you're gonna get out of it. And that's what I had to realize at that point in time. And I think about how easy it would have been for me to quit, right? I just had basically all four of my limbs blown off. Uh, I'm laying in a hospital bed. I can't do anything for myself. My arms don't work. Nothing works, right? How easy it would have been for me to quit? But then I think about the guys on the battlefield that day that risked their lives to save mine. And I think to myself, what a slap in the face it would be to them if I just laid around and did nothing the rest of my life. What was, what, what was even the point of risking your life to save mine if I was gonna come and do nothing with the rest of my life, right? So we always have to think about what other people have done for us and why we have to keep going and pushing. And all those letters and all those things that I got in the mail pushing me to strive to be better all the time, those are the things that drive us not to quit. I knew it wasn't gonna be easy, but I knew it was gonna be worth it, right? We think about all the time in our lives that we've had to do things that were really hard that we didn't wanna do. But we knew that when we got to the other side, it was gonna be worth it, right? Everything that I had to do for the first time was so hard, but I knew that it wasn't gonna be easy, but it was gonna be worth it. I thought about it all the time in Afghanistan, right? Once you get on that plane to go over there, right? What we're about to do isn't gonna be easy, but it's gonna be worth it, right? We think about it every single day when you wake up to go to work. It might not be easy today, but it's gonna be worth it, right? We're gonna get that check at the end of the day. That's the only reason that we're going, right? To provide. There's so many times in our lives that we have to stop and realize that it's not gonna be easy, but it's gonna be worth it. And do not allow yourself to quit. Keep that goal in front of you. One of the things I talk about the most is the first time you do anything is the hardest, right? You think about everything you've done in your life at some point in time is the first time that you've ever done it, right? It's just that we usually don't remember uh, very often how hard it was that, that the first time we did it because most of the time we do, the majority of our things, we're just a baby, right? We don't remember learning how to walk, but you watch a baby learn how to walk and they get frustrated, they can't move, they can't do those things. Well, one of the first things that I had to do waking up at 21 in my new version of my body was I, was I had to touch my nose, right? That sounds ridiculous. I mean, I, I got it pretty much mastered now, but my arm being broken, I couldn't, I couldn't move my arm. I couldn't do anything for myself. So if you can't touch your nose, you can't eat, you can't drink, you can't brush your teeth. That's a motivator. Have somebody else brush your teeth for a day. You'll learn how to <laughs> you'll stretch that arm out real quick, right? So I just, remember, I just remember every day I'd just sit there and I'd just try to touch my nose. I'd just try to touch my nose. Get my elbow to bend so I could touch my nose. And I think, honestly, I stretched my neck out more over this course of time than I ever did my arm. But 
I got it mastered now, right? And I'd have to, I just remember all the times, as soon as it gets hard, right? I had to learn how to do everything over again. That, that I, had, I, was, I was an infantryman in the U.S. Army, right? You'd send, me into, you'd send me to the worst places in the world to have the best outcomes. And now here I am laying in a hospital bed trying to touch my nose. You can see how defeating that could seem, right? But I, but I had to keep going. I had to keep pushing. And I just had to keep reminding myself that after I've done it once, it changes something inside of you. It changes something inside your mind going, I've done that before. I know I can do it again. And as soon as I could touch my nose, then I started to eat for myself. And I could take a drink on my own. And I could brush my own teeth. And I could start doing those things. And it's all about building momentum. I just felt myself getting better and better all the time as soon as I could do that. Then you, get a little, you gain a little bit, right? It's the little things, right? We just have to keep rolling those things in. And I just remember how, how, how fast you could progress once you had a little success. And then all of a sudden, you're thinking you're going to get out of the hospital. And then all of a sudden, I get told, hey, you have a really bad infection. You're not going anywhere. We had everything set up. We knew we were going to live. We knew all these things. We're, 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 we had all these plans. And then all of a sudden, they said, hey, you have an infection. You're going to be here for at least another week or two, maybe. And I had to get all these, go back into surgery and have all these drains put in. And what I learned from going through all that is that there's so many things in our lives that we can't control, right? So we have to control the things that we can and not worry about the things that we can't. When, the, when I got the news that I wasn't getting out of the hospital, and that's all I wanted to do. I remember that's the first thing I said when I woke up, but I wanted to do was get out of there, right? I had to look back and realize that I had no control over the, the fact that I got infection. But what I did have control over was my attitude. I did have control over my perspective. And I had to realize that, thank God I was still in the hospital. Thank God my surgeon was on call that night. He came in, checked me out, and said, yep, we're going to go in there and take care of this. But there's so many things that are going to happen in your lives, in my life still, all the time, every single day. There's so many things that happen that we have no control over. But we have to keep the right perspective, right? Like, hey, I, hey sorry I'm running late. But you have to, like, you know, so you can get really upset about that. But you're like, hey, don't worry about it. Get here when you get here. I just want you to get here. We look at the bigger scope of things, right? The pers attitude, the perspective of everything in life. There's so many things that we have no control over. Oh, this is a big one. I got to take a drink for this one. This is a big topic. We all face adversity, right? Adversity comes in so many different forms. And... Uh, one of my adversities is very apparent, right? I, you know, like uh, stairs, they can become incredibly difficult, right? But we find things that, that are adverse to us in our lives. Some people have mental adversity, right? And I was saying to myself, you know what? You know, you listen to everybody else saying, oh, you probably won't be able to pull that off. This won't work because of this. This won't work because of that. Why would you believe anybody before you believe in yourself, right? Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. Believe that you can do it. I and mean, if you believe that you can do it, you can achieve it. There's so many times in my life where I went, oh boy, I don't know how I'm going to get through this situation. But I always find myself getting through it, right? And you start building on those successes. But we all face adversity, and adversity, like I said, comes in so many different forms. But how we approach it, how we react when we go through it, all these different things, it all matters, right? So your attitude, your perspective. And adversity is, is one of those things that we're going to face every single day. And it doesn't matter who you are, we all have it, right? Everything in life is just complex problem solving and everybody's life is hard to them. That's one of the big things I talk about in my book is everybody has a thing. Even if you're born, uh, you know, for, and your dad's a multi, multi-millionaire, you're still going to have problems in your life. You're still going to face adversity. There's still going to be things that you don't like about this world. And it's the little things in life that matters. That's what I had to realize as I was going through this, right? It's the little things. It's those little wins. It's those little things that make us happy every single day, right? Like for me, when I open the door and I get home, my dog's there wagging his tail. He's so happy to see me, right? I take appreciation for that. I, it's the little things, right? Like when I'm going to the gym and I'm driving through down Victory Drive in Mankato, if you've ever been down that road, you know there's a lot of stoplights on that road. If you hit all greens one day, it's like the greatest thing in the world, right? Like I'm so excited, right? Like, oh my God, I saved 15 minutes today, right? Like it's the little things in life. Like today I was here on time and, and, and I didn't spill anything on myself on the way here, right? Like, that's a huge win, right? Like, you just have to find these little things every single day that make you happy, right? Like, there are just so many things that you can probably think about for yourself that it's just those little things that we have to appreciate every single day, right? Like, we're coming into town today, and it starts raining a little bit, right? And it's just like, well, here we go. And then all of a sudden, we pull in, and by the time we got out of the truck, it was done raining, right? It's those little things like, hey, I didn't have to deal with that today, right? There's so many things in our lives that are going to happen. But one of the main things that I talk about in my book towards the end is, is the joy is in the journey, right? This is so important to me. The joy is in the journey, right? When I see my whole life flash before my eyes, that was my journey flashing before my eyes. 
This whole life's a journey. And one of the things I talk about is I'm super lucky. I always joke, if you're ever gonna get hurt, get hurt in March, because there's so much basketball on to watch, it's great, right? And uh, I remember watching that, and, and, and I talked about that, and this guy said, hey, I got tickets to the, to the Final Four championship game in, at, at the U.S. Bank Stadium if you wanna go. Yeah, I'd love to go to that, right? The March Madness championship game. Like, how, well, of course, yes, I wanna go. So I got to go, right? And I'm watching the, one of the best basketball games I've ever watched unfold in front of me. And um, it's over, and the confetti's falling, and they get the ladder out, and they're cutting the net down, right? And these guys, that you've never seen guys smile so big in their lives, right? They just won the NCAA championship, right? And I thought to myself, it's all over for most of you right now, right? You guys, most of you guys will never play basketball another day in your life, you know, at, at, in an organized fashion like this ever again. But what I realized is it's all those things in their lives that built up to this moment, right? Playing basketball in the driveway with their friends, to playing basketball with their high school buddies, to playing on this college team, and all the, all the fun bus rides they had, and all the time they spent in the locker room, and all the, all, the, all, the, all the moments they got to share together on the basketball court that formed this, this journey for them. And it was all over, and it kind of gave me a, a sense of looking at life so much differently just at that point in time in my life, that, that we're all doing this. This is all just a big journey, and without the, uh, without the highs, the, you know, without the lows, the highs wouldn't be as good, and without the highs, you know, we, you, you, just can't, you have to have that balance in life, right? Like, things are gonna happen. Stuff is gonna happen, but how are you gonna make your journey, and how is it gonna be? You can make it whatever you want it to be, right? Like, when I woke up from that high ED, I was gonna define the rest of my life. This one's really important to me. This is probably one of the most important things that I talk about in my book is, is um, every day is a chance to impact a life, right? And what I mean by that is it doesn't have to be like, ta-da, we got you a brand new car, you know what I mean? Like on the price is right, right? We don't need to necessarily impact somebody's life like that every single day. But I don't think we even realize how small of a, of a, of a, of a di how big of a difference we can make in somebody else's life by the smallest gestures, right? Like smiling, going down the sidewalk at somebody and say, hey, I hope you have a good day today. You, know, you don't have to know that person. They could be a stranger. They could change their life, right? We have no idea what that other person is going through. There's so many things that we can pay for somebody else's coffee as you're going through the drive thru and you look back and you see the person saying, hey, you know, that person behind you, in front of you paid for your coffee, you know, and it's just, it's the little things every single day. Calling your buddies and checking on them and asking them if they're doing okay. You know, helping somebody out whenever you see somebody struggling. It's those little things. Like when people came out, like Kirk said, when people came out to support me when I first came home, they impacted my life to an extent they didn't even realize, right? So I had to go around and shake every one of those guys' hands. And from that point on, the rest of my life, uh, every time I see guys on a motorcycle carrying a flag, it, it means something different to me, right? I appreciate those little things in life that we were just talking about. And one of the last things I always talk about is being thankful and grateful, right? There's so many chances, there's so many times, and there's so many points in our lives that we can feel down, we can feel upset, we can feel defeated, we can feel not the best about anything going on in our lives, right? But then if we sit down, we actually take that sheet of paper, you know, the old trick, you know, put a thing down, put, put a line down the middle of paper, on this side, write everything in your life that's not going right, and on this side, write a list of everything you're thankful and grateful for, and you're probably gonna need 10 more sheets of paper for that right side, right, if you really think about it, you know? I think about every day that I wake up, the first thing I have to do every day when I wake up is check my attitude, because when I jump out of my, when I wanna get out of bed, the first thing I have to do is jump into my wheelchair, right? But I'm thankful and grateful that when I wake up in the morning that, that I don't have to split wood to keep my house warm, right? I'm thankful and grateful that I have plumbing in my house. I watch those Afghan people. Every day when they wake up, they had to go to the canal, no matter what the temperature was, you know? I'm thankful and grateful that I get to wake up next to my beautiful wife every single day, right? I'm thankful and grateful for, the, for all the people that supported me to go through all these things, right? All the teachers that got me to where I was, the, the, my leaders in the military, the... You know, the list goes on and on, right? I mean, at any point in time during this thing, I, can, I, could, I could sit here and tell you through every stage of my life how many times I was thankful and grateful to have the world's greatest surgeons putting me back together. How thankful and grateful I was for those guys risking their lives just to save mine, to give me a chance to live a longer, you know, life, you know? Like, how lucky I am to have those guys. There's so many things in this world that we have to be thankful and grateful for. We have to give appreciation to those things. And like I said, I was laying on the battlefield that day watching my life you know, literally flash before my eyes. And we've talked about building our attitude, we've talked about shaping our perspective. So this is kind of my, my tagline or my motto or 
whatever you want to call it. This is what I want you to take with you today. This is your call to action. Is I want you, everybody here to build your attitude and shape your perspective so one day when your life flashes before your eyes, it's worth watching. And think about that every single day. Am I doing something today that, that I'm going to want to remember? That's something that, you know, you can do that every single day. You can find that thing. And uh, I'm so thankful and grateful for everybody coming out today and, and listening to my story and, and, and uh, supporting me and supporting all these great organizations that help put this thing together. I've had nothing but great compliments on the book. Um, everybody says it's, a, it's an easy read. It's not really a war book. I don't really talk about combat a whole lot in the book, it's just the beginning. Um, it's pretty much about m me getting wounded and, and how and the things that I learned that I talked about today um, to getting where I am today now. And I appreciate everybody coming here today and everybody that organized this event. And uh, um, I'll stick around if anybody wants to talk to me. So thank you. <laughs>